I think there is a lot of ways that progressives, certainly socialists, can make a really great critique of of uh, of Elon Musk and um, his projects for uh, Mars colonization. Um, uh, you know, he's a you know union busting within within Tesla and the the, the appalling uh, working conditions there. Um, the fact that he's a he's a centibillionaire. Uh, just you know, with socialists, we would say there shouldn't be sent to billionaires. Um, I, and I wanted to develop more coherent uh, critiques. But one of the things that I was really worried about was that uh, there was a sort of um, well, there was a, a tweet that he had uh, put out um, in March where I th it was Bernie Sanders who had initially said some, uh, tweeted mm -hmm. something, or I guess his staff or whatever tweeted something about how you know uh, between Musk and and Bezos. Uh, they have more wealth than the bottom 40% of Americans. And, you know, that's a great, uh, great you know, line, great, great uh, critique. Um, and then um, Elon Musk responds to this by saying, he has his own tweets saying, you know, I am accumulating resources to make life uh, multiplanetary um, and extend the light of consciousness to the stars. <clears throat> and and then there were all this this sort of, uh, you know, snark and uh, particularly from some people on the left who were like, oh, you know, this is childish, this is colonial. Um, um, we have more important things to worry about right now here on Earth. Um, this is this is ridiculous. Uh, Earth w is the only home we'll ever have. And um, I really wanted to take apart those sort of ideas. Um, at one point, even uh, sort of Bernie Sanders responds to um, to that very quote by Elon Musk, and he said, and Bernie says, or again his staff uh, says, uh, says, space travel is an exciting idea, uh, but now we need to focus on Earth, and you know, then talks about the need for healthcare and and combating inequality, and all these are that's that's a great point, but <clears throat> I was really worried that this is a sort of um, false dichotomy that we can have, we can have space exploration, we can have space travel we can even in the you know distant future a space colonization and we can solve uh you know poverty and inequality we can have health care for all and we can have both um mm -hmm. there's a sort of uh, i mean just straight out of the gate um you know the uh, the, the pentagon has a budget of uh, like this year i i looked it up before i came on this year's um pentagon budget official budget is seven uh 753 billion dollars and nasa's budget is just 23 billion. So, you know, we could have a lot fewer wars and a lot more space very easily, even without, um, never mind socialism, just even just a little bit neoliberalism, a little bit less um, uh, militarism, we could have a lot more space. So it's, um, uh, I felt that this was a sort of, you're, Bernie, I love the guy, but in this case, he was wrong. Uh, he was sort of leaning into a sort of neoliberal uh, position that there's the p size of the pie is only so big, and we have to choose either healthcare or space. I would choose like yeah, um, less Pentagon, more more space. That was the sort of thing that I wanted to get across. So one cheer for Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's it's pushing back against kind of a, a more uh, austere way of thinking about politics. Exactly. Yeah. But wouldn't just to to push a little bit back, and then we'll kind of move on, but um because we as a socialist we still need to have priorities we still need to say yeah, this is sure. priority number one um but uh you're saying that we also shouldn't you know just because something isn't let's say um i'll, I'll just say like for my part i think healthcare is number one um yeah. but you know but we shouldn't then say that we you know there isn't a, still a list like we still have other priorities and the fact, and it might be the case that by draining the budget, um, you know, of the Pentagon, uh, you know, part of that might go into healthcare, but you know that it should also go into NASA. That it, you know, it could be multifaceted. Oh, I mean, just in the fair, uh, you know accounting level, it's fairly straightforward already to to be doing this. If we, uh, but but in the there's some more philosophical question around priorities. Absolutely, um, uh, even under a. Uh, you know, fully socialist society, we will still have priorities because there's still only so many resources that we could could uh, could could use, and certain certain things will be more um, more important than other things. But if we take it like a purely utilitarian approach, where we're just constantly maximizing um, utility, um, we run into all sorts of trouble straight away. 
you, we can go back to the, the, the old slogan from the, the, the turn of the last century from socialists and trade unionists who demanded you know, uh, um, not just bread, but roses too. Um, um, if, we, if we only focus on the sort of maximally uh, useful uh, um, items, then all of those other little things, um, well, maybe even so little things like music and art and, mm -hmm. and, and great food and craft beers and space, um, these are certainly nowhere near the, 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 the top of the list compared to um, uh, healthcare, let's say, but we still need those as well. We need a bit of, of, of color in our life as well. Mm -hmm. while we it, seems like the, it seems like the science is more of the bread than the roses actually though. Well, the, I mean, this is the other thing is that if we take a, again, a strictly utilitarian uh, focus here, um, this would basically say that um, we are only doing applied research now, only research that has a clear um, uh, near-term or medium-term benefit to humanity that we can project, predict. Um, and so blue sky curiosity driven research, what in the scientific community is called basic research, uh, we would say we weren't, aren't going to do any of that. Mm -hmm. But you immediately run into a problem there um, with applied research because applied research by, you know, the name is you're applying basic research. So you have to start somewhere in that, like, just like sense of wonder, curiosity. I have no idea what possible utility this is, but I just find it so cool that I want to discover more about it. Um, um, whether or not that will have any application. Now, the reality is that um, uh, almost everything that you do um, research uh, in, in terms of sort of blue sky basic curiosity driven research does inevitably um, have some sort of um, application. But if, but yeah, I mean, this, there's the same logic to say we should not do any space exploration, um, we should not do space travel, we should focus on healthcare alone. Uh, you know, the logic behind that would also say we shouldn't have a large Hadron Collider. Mm -hmm. um, it also says that we shouldn't be, you know, teaching uh, French literature at university, that we should only be studying math and economics and, and the hard sciences and medicine and engineering. I mean, this this is not a left wing argument at all. This is this is the argument that we hear on the right on a regular basis from conservatives who, you know, mm -hmm. like, why are we teaching you know, <laughs> cinema studies at public <laughs> universities? Um, you know, it's, I love, I love that. That's the standard conservative impression. Um, <laughs> they all sound like, you do. Um, that's good. Yes. so you also mentioned in your article, how you were, you know, at first skeptical about, you know, uh, building up, uh, space programs in developing countries mm -hmm. and how you, your mindset actually changed as you kind of looked into it. Can you talk about what, what changed your mind on that? Yeah. Wow. That's, you know, um, so, um, uh, a few years ago, I was I was working for for Nature, the science journal in the in the UK, and a lot of my focus at the time was on um, science in the developing world. And one of the stories that I, the sort of features that I pitched, um, uh, initially when I was um, going for the, the position um, that got me the position, I guess, and that they wanted me to explore was, um, I'd I'd heard a lot about. Um, space programs in uh, sub-Saharan Africa and uh, South, some South American countries. And I thought that I would have this nice sort of, if I dug deep into it, do a bit more research, um, I would find how this was, uh, you know, a nice little story about um, corrupt governments, neoliberal governments, wasting public spending, you know, in places where there aren't, you know, uh, proper roads where they don't have working uh, sewage systems. And these would just be like vanity projects for some, um, yeah, neoliberal um, semi-dictator or whatever. And, um, or never mind, I mean, just, I thought it would be this lovely story of bad priorities, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so that, you know, my editors let me uh, go off and do some research into this. And I, I called up a bunch of, um, engineers uh, from the UK and the US who were advising a lot of these programs. And I said, you know, do you want to speak off the record? So I could really get a sense of what was going on. And 
and uh, they they said, you know, you're not wrong. There is, you know, there is there's there's a lot of corruption. There's malfunctions. There's uh, delays. It's that's that's true. That is part of part of the story, but it's not the whole story. There is also um, genuine um, technology transfer. There is real transfer of skills and knowledge. Um, it's you know basically it's a bit of a mixed bag, and then all of them, every single one of them said uh, something along the lines of, um, however, when I got in country, and local people asked me what I was what what I was here for, and I told them I was helping, you know, um, build the the space the national space program. Um, uh, everybody would burst with pride. They were hmm. so uh, just, uh, yeah, proud that they also, that their country also could be pioneers and explorers. It, uh, they were just as good as, uh, as you know, the United States or the former USSR or some of the other countries have since got into the space race. And, um, and I realized, yeah, I mean, that's bread and roses right there. That the very people who are confronting, um, uh, you know, poor water systems or whatever, at the same time, are able to, in their heads, have a sense of like we want roses too, and uh, so I, I put my story away, and I never wrote it, and I wrote about um, um, the collapse of mathematical um, uh, training and knowledge in in sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, after the end of the Cold War, and how. Um, and the work of um, uh, Neil Turok, a uh, uh, South African um, physicist, uh, as you know, to build a new mathematical um, institute of mathematical sciences in Cape Town. Um, I, interestingly, he's the son of Ben Turok, who was the uh, the sort of the ar architect, the author of uh, the African National Congress's um, uh, armed struggle strategy during the uh, <laughs> fight against apartheid. Um, uh, yeah. Anyway, so that's so that's what I wrote about instead. And actually, that's perfect. You predicted my next question. Could you go into more like why was it that after the Cold War in these countries there was a decline in mathematical training? Yeah. So yeah, I mean that's that's a great great question. I wish more people, even within the scientific community, were uh, were aware of this this issue. Um, mathematics is the sort of the foundation of everything. Um, it's um, you can't never mind do any science if there isn't um, you know high quality mathematical training you're not going to be able to do like where do you get your 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 experts within your your finance department um, building enterprises um, engineering building roads infrastructure all of, all that stuff depends on a foundation a, fa a mathematical foundation and during the Cold War um, as a result of yeah, the uh, the rivalry between the United States and, and and the USSR, both both countries and France as well, um, spent um, a great deal of money um, on mathematical ma mathematical training in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and but at the end, of, after the end of the Cold War, they sort of basically stopped being interested in this. The whole point during the Cold War was to try to win one country or another country or part or factions within those countries to one side. Or the other side in the Cold War. Um, at the end of the Cold War, uh, that that ended, and that was fine for a while. But um, but those people these days are now, you know, they're getting very old. Um, they're retiring or dying, and there hasn't really been much of a replacement. And so um, the African um, Institute of, of Mathematical Sciences or AIMS uh, was created uh, to try to um, combat that, and they have. It's an amazing place. Um, there are um, not just uh, mathematicians, but cosmologists, mathematical physicists who uh, basically volunteer their time for months at a time. Um, and uh, it's completely free. Um, uh, people from right across uh, Africa can go so long as they're, they're clever enough. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing project. I mean, I think it's, 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 it's socialism before before our time, hmm. before time. <laughs> well, so it seems like so much of uh, space exploration and, and technology that goes into that process is being carried out in private hands. I guess yeah. even before I ask like a, a bigger question, just how much of that is in fact carried out by SpaceX and other companies uh, as compared to NASA? 
Well, one of the, I mean, one of the things that is a little bit, um, uh, a lot of people on both sides of the debate sort of um, uh, get wrong here is that um, even though prior to the, this sort of new era of commercial space uh, space flight, um, you know, the 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 zenith of 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 the space race. NASA was still using other companies to produce the widgets, the various different um, uh, parts of, of rockets and so on. Um, that really hasn't changed. I mean, it is not the case that SpaceX is, is going to space. NASA um, uses uh, SpaceX um, in the same way that, you know, historically it has been using well, until, you know, until recently the United Space Alliance, which is um, Boeing and Lockheed Martin. And the reason that they switched to uh, to SpaceX for a number of projects, uh, and you know, SpaceX is really kicking the United Space Alliance's ass, is because uh, the United Space Alliance, um, you know, they charge uh, I think it is four hundred sixty million dollars per launch, and uh, SpaceX is as of it's a few months ago. The numbers might have changed since then uh, when I was writing about this, but it was sixty two million dollars per launch, so a radical reduction. Um, and um, the the primary way that they've been able to achieve this is that um, Boeing and uh, Lockheed Martin are a classic example of uh, bloat in the private sector, where um, you know one one thousand two hundred of their components are outsourced to other companies, mm -hmm. and each of these companies will add their own uh, profit margin. And that's why you end up with a this grotesque figure of, of almost half a billion dollars per launch. Um, uh, Elon Musk, and I actually have to say this is this is a piece of genius, really. He is he went against all sorts of um, really right wing um, conventional wisdom within the business community since the 1980s. Uh, that said, you know, companies need to focus on on one thing and one thing alone, and they outsource everything else. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it's a sort of it's an echo of the the socialist calculation debate that uh, Michal Rosworski and I talk about within uh, the People's Republic of Walmart. And we'll get your copy. Yeah, Paul, get your copy. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the economic calculation debate or the conservative um, argument within the economic calculation debate actually had an impact on the private sector as well, and they thought that um, any sort of vertical integration um, was is 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 a bad idea. Mm -hmm. um, you're basically because the the conservative argument would be there are simply too many variables um, in this this vast um, supply chain. Um, uh, leave it up to markets instead. Uh, they're much more uh, efficient at allocation than trying to have that in house. And Elon Musk said, "No, this is this is nonsense." Um, and seventy percent of the components of his uh, of his rockets and other. Uh, so sort of products as, as SpaceX produces are made in house. And he's done a similar thing with Tesla where um, he has reached so far back into the supply chain uh, that, uh, that Tesla is now actually even uh, investing in lithium mines directly rather than like contracting with lithium comp mining companies. Um, and the reason for this is because it's uh, well, one, you you're cutting out all of the that that that, that salami slicing of, of profit margins, so you can produce a much cheaper product. But also, crucially, with respect to innovation, um, uh, all you have to do is you have somebody in in like you know a few desks down say to uh, the other person, "Well, we need this widget. Can you can you make this widget?" I say, okay, yeah, for sure. And the all the transaction costs that would normally be in place if that other um, uh, worker or engineer or whoever was in some other company are gone. So it, it streamlines innovation. It creates much more innovation. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, so as I say, one chair for, for Elon Musk um, <laughs> there. One chair. I mean, but that's like, it's, it's funny because like when your piece came out, uh, now much later than I realized. Um, there was a little bit of like a, a kerfuffle online about it because it was like, oh, Lee is uh, endorsing uh, space colonization. Um, Elon Musk wants space colonization. Lee wants space colonization. Um, Lee and Musk want the same thing, presumably. Yeah. Um, I Lee, guess- Lee is basically Columbus, basically. Yes, that's right, yeah. 
Absolutely. No, there were like, um, my God, there were uh, people saying uh, Lee Phillips, Jacobin, you know, they're, um, they're genocidal, they're endorsing uh, colon colonialism. And for fuck's sake, um, rocks are not people. Right. <laughs> rocks are literally not people. Like this is actually the, uh, the sort of genocidal mentality of uh, the colonialists uh, of the new world that they didn't conceive of um, indigenous people as equal to other human beings. They considered them less mm -hmm. like rocks or, or other animals or plants. Um, so the bizarre thing is that these people are, are you know, suggesting that Mars, uh, which may be, as far as we know, um, uh, bereft of all life, it's a rock. Um, if it isn't, there, there's some microbes there, but uh, there would be microbes there. I mean, I'm hoping that there is. Um, but because you want colonization, right? <laughs> actually, I, ironically, the yeah. um, the existence would, of, of microbes would uh, could potentially uh, uh, delay it. But uh, mm. that's uh, I actually I'm more in favor of um, colon colonization of Venus than mm. I have of Mars. Mm. Sense. Uh, just it's because and this goes back to the Elon Musk stuff. Um, so and this is where the, the 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 headline is actually quite accurate for the article. So um, we all focus on Elon Musk's tweets about this stuff, but he actually wrote a, an academic or an academic paper in 2017 in the in the journal New Space, which is this academic journal uh, devoted to um, the commercial space sector. Although judging by the quality of uh, Elon Musk's paper, I don't know what the quality of the actual, you know, academic quality of this this journal is. But um, anyway, um, mm -hmm. if you read that paper, he uh, he makes an argument as to why we need to be a multiplanetary species, and how we're going to go about doing this. And um, his argument is basically that at some point, their um, life on Earth might be uh, existentially challenged, and we need to spread human consciousness to other planets um, so that, um, well, for species preservation, preservation regions, reasons. But the bulk of the, uh, the paper is actually just an explanation of um, SpaceX's business model, the viability of making rockets reusable, which again, should radically reduce the cost of getting to space. Um, and he sort of, he, he hints at some of the issues with terraforming Mars, but he is very, it, basically it's just one or two paragraphs. And that's where the, re, the rubber hits the road because um, it's not just the cost of getting to space, which is the great uh, challenge. That's, that's the least of our issues. I mean, it's significant, but Mars is, and in fact, space as a whole is incredibly inhospitable to us. Um, um, humans that have spent months on the International Space Station, um, you know, they come back with terrible um, health conditions. Uh, some of them are, you know, incorrigible. They're, they're permanent. Um, and uh, the there are some aspects of this that we can we can we can correct, um, but ultimately. Elon Musk isn't talking about the the costs of correcting those those things in terms of spaceflight, but he's also crucially not talking about correcting the or the cost of correcting them on Mars. What he says is that he wants a an independent city. That is to say, it's not just an outpost; it's self-sustaining on Mars. But for that to happen, um, you basically have to terraform Mars. We 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 there are many many issues uh, that that that, uh, that we face there that I talk about in the in the article, one of which is the recently we discovered that um, like pretty much all of the soil is is uh, is penetrated by perchlorates, which are incredibly toxic to uh, to humans. We could potentially um, uh, bioremediate that uh, with with bacteria, but because and we when, whenever there are certain or perchlorate spills in, on Earth already, we use uh, we can bioremediate. So but that's just like one location. We're now talking about bioremediating an entire planet mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the cost and difficulty of doing that is so much greater than just say decarbonizing um, Earth's 
economy. I mean, that's an enormous challenge, but that's that's a that's a dawdle uh, compared to by remediating the perchlorates um, on an entire planet. And then, of course, the the real kicker here is that uh, that Mars has um, it's 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 very small. People don't realize this. Uh, Mars is it has a much smaller mass. It has therefore it has about thirty eight percent of Earth's gravity. And what we do know for sure is that uh, uh, low gravity, microgravity is uh, is incredibly dangerous to, to humans. Um, as I was saying, um, um, uh, astronauts on the International Space Station, you know, you, you eventually go blind, um, you, you begin to lose uh, fine motor function, um, you, uh, you lose executive function. I mean, effectively, over, and some of these things are, are fairly, fairly permanent. So like, you know, the, uh, if you're spending years in a microgravity environment, effectively every you know few months you're going to be getting closer and closer to do, you know the Martian equivalent of Alzheimer's. Hmm. Uh, that and that can't be solved. Uh, that there isn't a technical solution to that. If you smush, if you took Venus and you smushed it into uh, to Mars to make a new planet, you still wouldn't have the uh, quite have the uh, the uh, the mass and the the gravity of of Earth. Now Venus actually does already have. Uh, that's how small Mars is. Um, Venus does have uh, gravity, which is very and mass, which is pretty close to to Earth's, and so that is almost certainly um, a viable option. The problem with uh, Venus at the moment is, you know, it's this hot acid bath with you know ridiculous uh, atmospheric pressures. But those actually are um, um, soluble issues in the way that the, the, the low gravity of, 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 um, of Mars never will be. Um, it's a sort of, there's different kinds of impossible, right? There's impossible at the moment, and then there's like always impossible. And the, mm -hmm. the Mars low gravity is a sort of always impossible kind of condition. But with Venus, I mean, that's a project that would take generations and generations and generations to terraform it. Uh, I won't go into the details of the technology required to do that. And some of these technologies we haven't really um, uh, anywhere come close to developing yet. It mm. would be like a cathedral that um, over thousands of years, humans decide that this is what we want to do. Um, and and this is one of the arguments that I make in, in the piece is that um, that's not something that capitalism can do. There's no, if you're talking about this uh, sort of Venusian cathedral, terraforming Venus, over thousands of years, over hundreds of generations, um, there's no short-term return on investment for any uh, private sector actor. It has to be a public sector endeavor. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, you're, you're really, I'm, sign me up for the rocket. Um, <laughs> my, mind, my mind's a little blown right now, but. <laughs> um, I mean, but just to, just, to kind of put a, a point on this, um, you know, and uh, I think you kind of summed up pretty nicely why, uh, you know, SpaceX is probably not going to, to lead us towards this outcome, despite whatever Musk is, is advertising. Um, just like the structural requirements of companies needing to make profits within our, our given system, um, uh, you know. But why do we have to leave Earth? Like why, ultimately, why is it that we have to do this in the first place? Um, and, and just one point, just to maybe to usurp one of the points you're about to make, um, like the, the bit that you wrote about, um, James Hansen and, and, yeah. uh, and climate change, the importance, uh, for climate change, uh, was fascinating. I, I'd never known that, but yeah. Why, why do we have to leave the blue, the blue marble? So there's two reasons, uh, two applied reasons. This isn't even basic research reasons, these two applied reasons. The first in the very, very near term, immediate term. Uh, is that space science is earth science. Um, uh, James, Han James Hansen, the great sort of um, uh, NASA researcher, very famous for, most famous for his um, climate change work uh, and actually even campaigning for climate change, uh, for clim more aggressive climate change action. Uh, he was famously arrested outside the White House during the Obama administration because he felt that the Obama administration wasn't going far enough in terms of um, aggressive climate action. So, you know, he's a real hero of, of, of climate change. He's probably, the one of the reasons that he's also probably most well known is that his testimony to Congress in 1988 um, uh, was sort of the, 
uh, coming out party for, for global warming as a real issue. There were other scientists who knew bits and pieces of the story before, but this was the first time that really the uh, the the, uh, the public had any sort of awareness of it. So he's, you know, he's, he's a sainted figure. Mm -hmm. The reason that he got into climate change issues in the first place and doing climate change research was that he was fascinated by um, Venus's atmosphere, which had, you know, in the in the deep past uh had a runaway greenhouse effect and that's that's why it is the way it is and he sort of clocked like oh wait that has relevance to earth with respect to combustion of fossil fuels and as we now know a number of other processes like steel production cement production aspects of agriculture um and so we dove into uh to uh to climate change research uh, this is what i mean when i say um, uh, earth science, sorry, space science is earth science. NASA, is, we think of NASA as a place that as an agency that took us to the moon. It was, but it's much more in terms of uh, what it does on a day-to-day -day basis. It's, it's probably the premier earth science agency, uh, research uh, agency in the world. Uh, from the Landsat uh, program dating back to the 1970s to the roughly about 40 different um, um, earth science programs that it has at the moment, mostly satellite driven, you know, it is how we get our information about um, um, uh, forest cover loss, uh, deforestation, uh, how we get our information about the uh, decline of, 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 of sea ice, of uh, ice cap melt. Um, it's increasingly how we're going to be enabling uh, the monitoring of uh, pledges by countries to decarbonize and whether they're actually doing it and, and monitoring their uh, their carbon emissions from space um, uh, with greenhouse gas emissions, so not just carbon emissions. Um, it is it, it just so in the short term, it makes no sense to say we need to focus on the earth instead of space. Focusing on space is focusing on the earth. In a much longer, much, much, much longer uh, term, in about 600 million years, um, as the luminosity of the sun increases, it will increase to such an extent that it will basically destabilize the, uh, the carbonate uh, silicate uh, cycle, which is a very, very long um, cycle on Earth where won't go into too many details of it unless you want me to. Uh, but basically, what this means is that- I mean, I want you to, but you you should probably not. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I love my geology, so- All right, let's I, do I, it. I could, but um, the, the, the short version of the story is that basically the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will decline precipitously, lower than the, the, the concentration levels that um, in, uh, enable trees and many other plants uh, to, to exist, to photosynthesize. A um, uh, number of million years later, um, ultimately all plants will uh, cease to be able to, uh, to, to exist. And of course, um, you know, plants are um, the, the, and other primary, what are called primary producers to so the foundation of the food web. Animals and everything else uh, depends on, on, on plants. Uh, so all uh, sort of life begins to, uh, the, all non-microbial life basically uh, begins to sort of fall apart at that point. Um, and then within one billion years, um, the sun has expanded to such an extent that the uh, the oceans of the earth will boil off, uh, which will be great fun. And then uh, really all that will be left at that point will be the sort of extremophile um, uh, microbes uh, clinging onto the, the holes and cracks of the geosphere. Um, and uh, so like for the same reason that we need to solve climate change and biodiversity loss, which is you know, to protect and preserve the conditions on Earth that have allowed humans to flourish. Basically, it's self-preservation. It's pre preserving the species. <clears throat> um, we, at some point within the next 600 million years, we, knew, we do need to get off this rock. And in fact, because um, uh, this, these sort of processes happen throughout space, <clears throat> we want to get to as many worlds as possible, spread human consciousness as far as as possible, <coughs> in order to maximize the uh, the chances of human consciousness remaining um, um, in the universe. I mean, I mean, the reason that I, from a non-religious perspective, find humans to be so particularly special is that we are the universe becoming aware of itself. 
there is no purpose in the universe outside of what what we create. Mm -hmm. um, a universe without humans is 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 a pointless universe. <laughs>